Okay, all. It is time for unit three and four. Let's go. Let me know when you get here. Drop me a comment. Unit three and four. Here we go. Let me know when you guys get here. Drop me a comment down there. Hey, Luz. How you doing? Have you come to play trivia yet? I don't know yet if you're coming tomorrow or not, but if you're coming tomorrow, this is going to help you. The teams that were winning trivia today were ones that listened to the live yesterday. So they had the inside information. Okay, so tonight we're going to do unit three and unit four. I'm going to give everybody a minute to hop on here. Does anybody have any last minute questions about their timeline while we're waiting for some others to join us? Just let me know if you have any last minute questions. That is due on Friday. Hello, how are you? Uh, okay, I think we might need to. Okay, let me know, Luz, what's your question? Oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. Could the cause and effect be how one event we listed led to another even we also listed? Um, I'm not sure what you mean, but cause and effect basically, so like you could say, a cause of the Colombian exchange was the fact that um, they wanted to explore and find new routes to India, and an effect of the Colombian exchange is the effect that was on natives, and then you could explain that. Does that answer your question? And then are you talking about like what the cause of the effect on the natives would be? And you kind of just like continue down the line, kind of like a domino effect. That could work too, if that's what you're meaning. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome into the live tonight. We are going to talk about unit three and unit four. If you have not come to the Learning Commons yet for AP World Trivia, then this will be super helpful for you. If you have, then it's still super helpful for you for the final. Um, however, uh, it's really helpful if you're coming tomorrow for that trivia game because a lot of the kids that were on teams that had watched the live last night, they were ready to go for trivia. Uh, also, if you've not watched the live from last night, that's unit one and two. So you're going to want to do that before we take the final. And if you have any last minute questions about the timeline, just put them in the chat and I will get to them. So we're going to start with unit three, and that is land based empires. And those empires are going to be our, our gunpowder empires. So first of all, let's talk about some similarities with all the land based empires. You'll want to put down that land-based empires, uh, they basically are wanting to spread to show their power and influence. And they're centralized governments where bureaucratic elites run the government. Um, you can also put down similarities, uh, four similarities, that they collect tributes from weaker states and taxes from the citizens to be able to run the government. One way that they legitimize their power is through building great architecture and great structures. We talked about how uh, Versailles was built in France. We talked about the Taj Mahal in India. All those things were like big palaces, shrines to show their power. Uh, they also use art and monuments to legitimize their power in, I think it was, the Ottoman Empire, they especially used art. Wars are fought over religious differences because sometimes religion really, really plays a part in their government as well. And the decline of these land-based empires starts after 1750. And that's when people start to identify themselves with the ethnicity that they are instead of this big, huge empire. 
Okay, so those are some similarities with all the land-based empires. Let's go on to context. So we have gunpowder spreading. All right, this is context now. Gunpowder is spreading. This gives them the opportunity to continue to build a bigger empire. And these uh, empires are going to rely on gunpowder basically for power and the ability to defeat and control large territories. These empires uh, include three Islamic empires. Remember, the gunpowder empires are the Ottoman, the Safavid, and the Mughal. So make sure you get these down. These are the three we're going to focus on with the land-based empires. At the same time that the gunpowder empires are trying to explain, expand, the, I think it's Qing, Q-I-N-G, I need to still work on my Chinese pronunciation, um, but that empire of China is also expanding, and um, it was invaded several times, but despite, it continues to prosper. Also, Europe is exploring and expanding at the same time. So in 1492, Christopher Columbus came across uh, the Americas, and the French, English, Spanish, Dutch, they all tried to get a piece of that. And they all um, try to form these connections with the Americas. So even though in class we talked about these and then we talked about Europe expanding, it's happening all during the same time period. And you should have seen that on your timeline when you did your timeline. So the trade routes are eventually going to connect the Americas with Europe, but that happens a little bit later. And then also in Europe, we have some new monarchies and they're basically trying to centralize power. They're doing this by collecting taxes, using religion and military as well to legitimize their power. The other thing that's going on in Europe is that the middle class is growing and it's going to um, result in the monarchs are really trying to decrease the power of nobles and build their private armies. So that's a little bit about context. If you were, ha if you have to write anything about context from this time period, those would be good things to include. So the first one we're going to talk about is Ottoman Empire. So make some notes about the Ottoman Empire. This one uh, starts around the 1400s where it's starting to gain major traction and become a major power. It's actually founded in the 1300s and it doesn't end until 1918. Remember, it's the longest running one. It's about 600 years that it's being ruled by the same dynasty. Okay, um, it is a Sunni dynasty and we have... Um, Mehmed II, he's the one that conquers Constantinople, changes the name to Istanbul. Have you heard that song, Istanbul was Constantinople, now it's Istanbul? <laughs> anyway, it's one of my favorite songs. I love it. Um, but anyways, um, he, he conquers Constantinople, the Ottoman take control of it. And we talked about how when the Ottomans take control of Constantinople, that cuts the Europeans off from the major trade routes. And then they have to be pushed to explore other places. So that's another part of context as well. Okay, so Ottomans, uh, back to them. We also have the Ottomans, the Devsherm. This is important. The Dev Sherm is the gathering of Christian boys. Remember the young Christian boys that they would gather up, they would train to be uh, soldiers, elite soldiers for the Sultan. They would convert them to Muslims, uh, or sorry, they'd convert them to Islam, and they would become Muslims, that's what I meant. And um, sometimes they would also be given civil administration jobs. So there were some times that parents really wanted their kids to have this position because of the power that went along with it. Anyways, uh, they ended up being basically a strong military force, and they're called Janissaries. So when they become soldiers, that would be their name, and I think there's only one N, Janissaries. Eventually, as time goes on, they kind of get too powerful, and they threaten the Sultan's power. He will eventually... Um, 
pretty much ambush them and destroy the Janissary for forces, which is a sad ending for them. But overall, um, it brought great suffering to the Christian community because they were losing their sons to this Devshirm or the gathering. Sometimes they would resist by bribing the guards or by marrying their sons off at young ages because the Janissary was not, were not allowed to be married. Around 1650 is when it's pretty much just going to die out. All right. This is for the final, Emma. Yes. Everything I'm going over tonight is from unit three and four of your study guide. Basically, if you take notes on this, you have the study guide. Okay. Uh, and then unit one and two was last night in the live. And that was from the study guide of unit one and two. All right, so Janissaries, once again, I told you they are great warriors. That's something that you need to remember about them. And they represented the Sultan. The reason that the Sultan ends up getting upset with them is because they, they kind of um, revolt against some of the reforms that he wants to do. And that's when um, they don't survive much longer after that. Okay, role of women in the Ottoman Empire. Basically, there was the harem, and these were women that were in the private quarters of the sultan, kind of like wives, but not technically wives. And it was basically a system that was designed to produce heirs uh, for the sultan. And unique, because in this case, the harem was kind of like slaves, and so a slave could actually produce the heir to the throne, which is interesting. And they were looked after by the queen mother. Ottoman decline. Basically, this happens around the 1800s is when it starts. And it was a rise of nationalism that causes this because there are so many ethnic groups within the Ottoman Empire that they start to look at themselves as ethnic instead of as Turkish. And we'll get into that a lot more as we get into the next unit. All right, so uh, Safavid. Let's go to the Safavid dynasty or the Safavid Empire. Good to see everybody here tonight. Looking forward to you guys taking your final. I know you're going to rock this thing. All right, so the Safavid, they are established in what's modern day northern Iran. And uh, their society exported carpets. Many were farmers and herders. Their women in the Safavid were permitted to participate in society, but they wore veils and they had restricted movements. Islamic law did not allow, or sorry, did allow them to inherit and in extreme cases, sometimes to get a divorce. So they did have some minor rights. The decline happens pretty fast with Shah Abbas. And basically there's too much spending and corruption by the leadership and the government. Trade is going to also decline. International trade is slow. Agricultural production is as well low. And in 1722, they um, are put under siege. And because of that, there's some high military costs, inflation, decline in overland trade, and it weakens them. Now, those effects of the decline is that there's still tension in the Middle East today between the Sunnis and the Shias. And so that tension still exists. That's the Safavid. Next, we're going to talk about the Mughal. All right, so Mughal is um, founded by a descendant of the Mongols, actually. And... Um, they used Ottoman military tactics to conquer, so they kind of borrowed those tactics in order to build their large empire. They established a dynasty that lasts over 300 years. And um, one of the rulers of the Mughal Empire was Akbar. Akbar is religiously tolerant, and um, he governs a large non-Muslim population. Muslim rulers were um, basically like brought, they brought the Hindu subjects together. So that's what he was trying to do. He was really trying to encourage unity, encourage intermarriage. Um, he abolished the Hindu head tax and he incorporated Hindus into government. He was all about the unity of the government and being religiously tolerant. He had less restrictions on women. 
allow remarriage of widows and discourage child marriages, which at that time was was pretty popular. Um, he also promoted Hindus to highest ranks. So he was allowing them to be in government, even though they weren't his religion. He created what was called the divine saint. And the divine faith was a mixture of Hinduism, Islam, Zoroastrianism, and, and Sikh. Sikh is spelled like this. So it was a combined, uh, a combination rather of all of these religions, kind of like a hybrid of these religions. And this flourished well um, until Akbar's death. So things were pretty good when he was around. Now, um, I'm not following your study guide exactly to the to the letter. I'm going a little bit out of order, but I did check to make sure that everything we talk about is on your study guide and has something to do with the final. So just so you you know that that's the case. You are look. Yes, we're talking about the questions on the review loose, but I'm not following an exact order. I did go through and make sure that I had everything, but I went by the order of the textbook. And I looked at all that information first, and then I looked through the review to make sure it was all on there. So it is all on there. It's just not in the exact uh, order. Okay. Another thing that you need to remember about the Mughals, their tax collectors were used to legitimize power, and they are spelled like this, a, Zam a Zamindar. That's a tax collector in the Mughal Empire. Yes, yeah, kind of a refresher, Tuan. That's very good. Yeah, because basically your final is going to be multiple choice and it has stimulus attached. So you're going to have to know this background information to be able to understand the stimulus. All right. The other thing that is going on right now is the caste system. Remember, Hindus support the caste system, but um, Buddhists, Muslims do not. They want equality. Remember the caste system. You're born into it. There's no social mobility. And if you're at the bottom, you just have to try to live a better life in order to be reincarnated later at a better level. So that's also a challenge because um, during the Mughal time, of course, Akbar is trying to make more things more equal and, and calm and kind of combined. And that works a little bit while he's alive. However, uh, once he dies, things change and um, his grandson takes away some of the reforms but then the next guy his name is spelled like this i'm not even going to try to pronounce it because i will get it wrong i'm sure this guy is after akbar's grandson and he pretty much reverses everything that akbar did yep that's how it's spelled um Tuan, very good i'm not really sure how to pronounce it though I mean, it might be phonetic, um, but it's an interesting name. So once he comes into power, he reverses everything. He bans worldly things such as dancing. He destroys Hindu temples. He imposes the tax on non-Muslims. That's how. You, this is how you spell that. That's the tax on non-Muslims. He puts that back into law. He also forces Islamic law, and Hindus begin to re revolt. These revolts are going to fracture the empire. And that brings us to the fall. What happens is basically they're on attack from all sides. They're too weak to defend themselves. And it sets the stage for the British to be able to come in and colonize. All right. Um, one effect that you need to know is that the Mughal Empire was once a multicultural place. It was one of the very first multicultural empires where there was religious tolerance. So that's kind of the legacy of the Mughal Empire. Uh, once it ends, though, the antagonism between Hindus and Muslims is just going to increase. And actually, the British are going to kind of play to that and they're going to make it worse. Yeah, they were religiously tolerant. You're right, Tuan. But this one, I think what the textbook means when it's talking about that is that the Mughal Empire was kind of like more consolidated, I guess. Whereas with the Mongol Empire, we had different parts and they were kind of um, progressing and developing 
on their own a little bit differently. Like you had the Yan dynasty and you had what was going on in Persia and Russia and everything was a little bit different. So I think that's what they mean. Okay, so all the while, while this is going on in Europe at the same time frame, we have the Black Death going on, which basically ends feudalism, the Gutenberg printing press, which in increases literacy. Remember the Gutenberg printing press was actually fashioned from a printing press that they had in China first. China invented it and the Europeans improved it. So that's a little bit about what was going on at Europe at the same time. Uh, also in Europe, we have the Protestant Reformation. Remember that's with Martin Luther, our buddy Martin Luther and the 95 Theses. That's how you spell that. That was 95 reasons that he was upset with the Catholic Church. One of the reasons he was upset was indulgences. Indulgences were basically ways that you could pay off your sin. And it was a way of just being able to go out and do whatever you wanted. And then oh, you can just pay like a fine to the church and then your sins will be forgiven. And Martin Luther said, nope, that's not biblical. I think we should get rid of that. And he has success with this because of the Gutenberg printing press. The Gutenberg printing press basically makes it faster and cheaper to print information about what's going on. And people have it more in their hands and they're able to actually learn more about it. Before him, there were many others who tried to do the same thing, but they didn't have the printing press to get that information out there. Okay. So let's keep going on. So Protestant Reformation happens and the Catholic Church answers to that with the Counter-Reformation because they, of course, don't want to look bad. They want to try to um, make themselves look better. And so they um, try to correct the abuses by reaffirming the power of the church through the Counter-Reformation. And they have a meeting called the Council of Trent. It's a possibility you'll see some documents from the Council of Trent on your final. So know that that is a part of the Counter-Reformation. Remember that they legitimize their power through the divine right of kings. So they're saying, hey, religiously, as, king, as a king, we're born in this position because of God, and God sets us up to rule. So therefore, we have the right to be able to rule. That's the divine right of kings. Okay, uh, Luz, I'll get back to you. Just let me finish Europe here. Okay, so in France, we have King Louis. He builds Versailles. Remember, Versailles is that humongous palace, way too big for a king and a queen. Um, but he does that to legitimize his power, to make himself look like, hey, he's powerful and we really should serve him. Scientific revolution happens in the early 1600s. This is where they start to look towards science versus just religion for answers. So that's important to remember. We have a famous scientist dur during that time named Francis Bacon. And one of the things that he does is he thinks that you should collect data to form a hypothesis and to research and basically like study your hypothesis. And that's how you spell this, that theory. Let me make sure I got it right here. Remember, this is the first time that that's really happening. Before this, it would just be, well, what does God think? What does the Bible say about this? But now they're actually starting to research and bring science into things. In Russia, we have Russia expanding because of the fur trade. And they're basically expanding all the way through Siberia to the Pacific coast. Eventually, some explorers will go from the Pacific coast over to Alaska and down the west coast of the New World in the Americas. We also have serfdom in Africa, or in Russia, sorry, <laughs> been a long day. Uh, so serfdom happens in Russia, and that's basically that they are tied to the land. They cannot leave the land. It's not a very good life, but this is, would be your low peasantry. And last but not least, in Russia, we have Peter the Great, and he is a supporter of Orthodox Christian he builds St. Petersburg to be one of the grandest cities to kind of show his power, legitimize his power. 
you ever get a chance to go there, it's amazing. These palaces are just unbelievable. There's just rooms that are floor to ceiling, solid gold. And this is what they would do with the wealth and the money of the country to show that they should be in power. All right. Uh, Lou says, I just wanted to ask if this is incorrect. For the project, I put that a cause of the rise of Dahomey was the Middle Passage. Dahomey? Uh, was that an error in um, spelling? I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about. Um, be specific. Do explain that they conducted raiding and then they... The cycle repeats, okay. Oh, the Dahomey Kingdom, okay. Um, so yeah, yeah, you could talk about that. And like Tuan said, be specific and um, talk about all the specifics of it. So yeah, that would work. Okay, let's get back to this. Um, we're gonna talk about China now. So China during this time, the Ming are in charge and they expand China. The Mongol leaders actually defeat the Ming because remember the Mongols still exist, they're just not really in control anymore of that area. And so they defeat the Ming army and they actually hold the emperor prisoner for a little while, which I thought was kind of interesting. And during that time, the, the Ming restored the Great Wall of China because they're worried about being invaded. And eventually they are, they are overthrown by the Manchu. And uh, during that time when the Manchu are in charge, they will start to form some trading deals with the European. Europeans. Prior to this, the Europeans weren't really allowed in China. They were kind of like isolated or they were trying to stay isolated. And now they're allowing that to come in a little bit more. And they also have high taxes during this time that the peasants will rebel against. And so there's a lot of peasant rebellion going on. Okay. Now we have Africa. So Africa, we have the Songhai Empire, and this is how you spell it. And um, they are under the leadership of that ruler. And he legitimizes his power basically by promoting Islam. So through religion, remember that's one way to legitimize power. He brings them under a centralized government as well. Those are two things you can pretty much always count on with these large empires. You can talk about how they legitimize their power with art and religion and uh, you know, building these great structures and architecture. And you can also talk about centralized governments. Okay, so just a little FYI, if you see something like that in your SAQ, you can usually use that across the board. All right, those are our land-based empires. Now we have maritime empires. That would be anything oceanic, okay? Maritime, that's what that means. So the context here, once again, we talked about this already, but I'll mention it again. The Ottoman Empire conquers Constantinople, cuts off Europe from the trade routes. Now they have to find new ways to trade. They also, around this time, have new technology that enables them to travel quicker and more efficiently. And transatlantic trade uh, will begin when the new world is found. So the European traders, they um, become the go-between between the old world, which would be Asia, Africa, Europe, and the new world. And some uh, technological advances that they have are some new te uh, mapping techniques, also some new ships. The caravel is one that we could mention. You'll probably see that word again. And uh, at this time, Europeans are going to also try to export more than they import. Why would they do that? Well, they want to keep the wealth in their country. If they're exporting more and importing less, then they're obviously making more money. And so that whole theory is called mercantilism. And that's what they're going to try to accomplish. Mercantilism. All right. Basically, keeping the wealth in their country. The Portuguese are also going to expand during this time. We have a guy by the name of Prince Henry the Navigator. He's, of course, a prince. He wants to look for a water route to the east, and he starts 
um, by going down the coast of Africa. He's actually the one that's going to start importing African slaves. There's an explorer named Diaz. He will explore around the tip of Africa, but he doesn't make it all the way to India. The first person to do that is Vasco da Gama. He's the first one that will make it around the tip of Africa and discover a way to get to India. So this kind of starts the ball rolling on the Portuguese forming a huge trade empire. And what I mean by that is that they basically have ports all over that they charge a tax for sailors and uh, boats to go through there. Now, it was a great idea and a huge, um, huge profit if they could actually pull it off. The problem was they didn't have the manpower to enforce that. So it doesn't really ever come to play the way that they want it. All right, around this time then, the Spanish an annex the Philippines and they take over Manila and make that the hub for the silver trade. So when we talk about the silver trade, we have uh, South America here. Oh, that's really bad. And the silver is going up to Central America into Mexico. That's a little better. And so it's going up here like this, and then it boards the Spanish galleon. Remember, one of these large treasure ships. And it starts heading off over towards Japan, but it goes a little bit lower and actually ends up in the Philippines in Manila, where it's traded and eventually will go up to China. All right, that's horrible rendition of that, but you get the gist, right? So this is around the time that um, Spanish uh, Spain is doing this. They're they're using indigenous people to mine the silver. It's a very dangerous job. They don't live very long. But the reason they're using indigenous people instead of slaves is because the silver mines are at very high altitudes, and Africans cannot survive there because they're not used to that altitude and that environment. Uh, okay, so eventually the effect of this is going to cause inflation in Spain and China because there's too much money, there's too much silver in the economy, and that causes problems. But at first it was successful. Um, they are going to use the Mita system which was an Inca system, M-I-T apostrophe A. And this was basically a, a system used by the Incas to get people to work on public projects. The Spanish adopt this and they require the natives to work in this system in the silver mines. Another system that is a coercive labor system, all of these systems fall under that terminology, is the encomienda system. This one is similar to that, except this one is from the Inca system. All right, so it's kind of adopted from that. And this one, they work for food and shelter. So you could say they're getting a little bit of payout from their work in this one, but not much. It's, it's not equivalent to the amount that they work. So it's still a coercive labor system. The French are also over in the New World. The French are mostly up in the northern part of the New World, up around Canada. And they're going to control the northern fur trade. They're pretty friendly with the Native Americans because they depend on the Native Americans to trade with. So, of course, they're not going in to try to kick them out of their land. They're going in to trade with them. Whereas the English, on the other hand, want the land. So that's why the English and the Native Americans don't get along very well. Whereas the French and Native Americans realize that they needed each other, so they had to kind of value each other and, um, and, and be nice to each other, be amicable, right? We have the English colonies. They're starting uh, their settlements. They're, one of their first is Jamestown, 1607. They also have a settlement in uh, North Carolina and or what will become the North Carolina colony. They grow cash crops to export like tobacco and um, tobacco is really the most important one and then sugar will come later. Uh, the Dutch claim 
New York. That's important too. So the Dutch are also there. We have the French, the English, the Dutch, and the Spanish all in the New World. Dutch are going to claim New York. They call it New Amsterdam at the time, and it kind of becomes the hub for Dutch trade, specifically in furs. Colombian exchange, that's a big deal during this time frame as well. We have lots of negatives with the Colombian exchange. It brings diseases like smallpox, and the reason why the natives don't get sick is because they don't have immunity. Why do they not have immunity? Because they don't have domesticated animals. Very important to remember that part. If they would have had domesticated animals, they might have been immune uh, because you get diseases from the domesticated animals. Remember, the Europeans lived with their domesticated animals, usually in the same room. And so that's why they were getting these germs and diseases and therefore getting immunity. Okay, another negative is that cash crops result in the need for labor, slave labor. And so the slave trade is a big deal because of this. They need a lot of slaves in order to produce these cash crops. Native Americans were not working as slaves, mostly because they weren't immune, so they were sickly and dying. It was easy for them to run away because they knew the land. And slaves, there weren't, it wasn't that problem. They already had domesticated animals, so they were already immune, and they didn't know the land well enough to escape. Some still did, of course, but not the, at the rate that the natives were able to do it. Another negative was deforestation. They're doing this in order to have more land for their cash crops. Also, soil depletion because they're not letting the land rest, and it's sucking all the nutrients out of the land. Another negative would be overgrazing of cattle. So they're bringing these domesticated animals in. It's completely changing the environment. The new world hadn't had that before. Also, something to note negatively is the social structures are going to change. And this is the first time that social structures are going to be based on race. Prior to this, it was mostly based on where you were born in the social structure. Now, in Latin America especially, Social structures are all going to be formed around your race. So there were several different classes here, and I want to make sure that I get these right. This one is spelled like this. And this would be someone who is born on the Iberian Peninsula. So basically born in Spain or Portugal, born in the Old World. specifically the Iberian Peninsula. Is there two ends? I think there's two. No, there's only one end in the peninsula. Okay. Then your next one, you have the Criollos. And these are Europeans that are born in America. So as you can see, this is number one, this would be number two. If you're born in America, you're not technically as good as somebody that was born in the old world. And then we have the castas. Castas just means mixed. So all of these are going to be the mixed groups. We have the mestizos. Mestizos are going to be European and natives. We have the mulattoes, and they are European and African, and Zambos are uh, mixed native and African. So this is the first time that people are going to be characterized and classed more according to their race. I'll give you just a quick second to get that down. Nope, let me get out of the way. This is going to become important later when we talk about the Latin American revolutions because all of these groups are going to play a significant role in that. Okay, if you still need some more time to write that down, just hit pause and you can get it that way. All right, now we do have some positives coming from the Colombian exchange. The first is the horse. The horse, of course, 
The horse, of course. Huh, it rhymes. Ah, oh, been a long day. I, I get um, giggles out of different things. Okay, so anyway, the horse was um, an animal that is going to really shape the Native Plains culture of the Native Americans. Basically, they had buffalo out there, and with the horse, they were able to hunt it more efficiently. And um, it basically changes their whole culture because now they can hunt better and they can kind of form their own culture around the buffalo. So that's how it changes their area. Also, it's going to help with travel and farming, and so it helps the natives in that way as well. The food exchange is going to better the diets in Europe and Africa. And new hunting and warfare techniques, of course, guns and swords are being brought over. And so that is both kind of a positive and a negative. You could argue it either way. We also have slavery coming over. That's definitely a negative effect. Some culture changes happen as a result of that. For example, we have new languages that spring up. One of them is called Gula, and this one is a mixture between African languages and English. It will be spoken mostly in um, the Carolinas as well as Georgia, and there are several others as well. This is just one example. We have new music developing, and um, in Africa, because males are absent, women take on lead roles, so they get a lot more power in Africa. Um, indentured servants. That's another thing that you need to be aware of. They're the ones that uh, work seven years in order to pay off their debt. Usually the term is around seven years and then they're set free. However, they're more expensive than slaves because eventually they're going to be set free. And so that's why slavery was a little bit more appealing to people who need labor because the slave would actually be the master's property. Okay, so what's going on in Africa during this time? Well, we have two big kingdoms in Africa during this time, and one is called the Ashanti Kingdom, and the other, I just thought, oh, the Congo. So we have Ashanti, King, Ashanti Empire, and then we have the Kingdom of the Congo. And they're basically expanding because of trade, specifically slave trade as well. They participate in that. And um, Africans, like I said, were very needed because they're immune to diseases. And so the uh, African chiefs knew this and they were willing to um, basically capture and use other tribes, maybe their enemies, as slaves and sell them into slavery. They came across to America on the Middle Passage, so that would have been the, the point where they would have been on the slave ship. That was a very bad way to come over. It was not, not good at all. I mean, they, they didn't see the sun much. They didn't get fed a lot. Basically, they just had to keep them alive until they got to the Americas, so it was a very long and arduous journey for them. All right, uh, Japan. What's going on in Japan during this time frame? Well, they are restricting trade networks, so they're also practicing isolation. The Portuguese and Dutch will first go to Japan, and they try to convert them to Christianity. They're pretty successful, actually, but this becomes a problem because the Christians in Japan start to burn and destroy Buddhist shrines, and, of course, the Japanese are not happy about this. And so, as a result, the Japanese government is going to actually ban Christian services and start to limit the foreign influence. Um, they basically are going to try to remain isolated, and they do this for around the next 200 years. So they're trying to just keep everybody out. China is also somewhat limiting trade during the Ming Dynasty because they're trying to get back to their Confucian ideals. And eventually this is going to be reversed, though, and they will get back into trade more on a global scale. You know that they participate in the silver trade, and they're very big on wanting to get the silk out there as well. Okay. Um, so also during this time, Europeans' uh, powers are going to really uh, – uh, they're going to – man, I'm so tired – I totally feel y'all's pain. Uh, only a little bit longer, guys, and then we can sleep in. Okay, so 
Uh, get back to this. Let's see. The European powers are going to be able uh, to be competing for trade on a global scale. And basically, Britain uh, takes control of India. I remember, we talked about that at the end of the Mughal Empire. And they start what's called the India East Company. And that's kind of like a trading um trading uh, post that are um, all over in the area and kind of controlling the trade. We also have the Treaty of Tordesillas, which is in 1494. Let me spell that for you because that's a mouthful. Let's see. Uh, where did it go? It is spelled like this. And basically what that does is it divides the new world between Spain and Portugal. However, it didn't really take into the account that the French and the British also want a piece of the pie. And the French and the British, they're pretty much going to take and claim North America, whereas Spain and Portugal will be more in Central and South America. Spain will eventually try to come into America. They have some in Florida and uh, they'll claim more in Mexico and try to come up into the Texas area as well, but they'll eventually kind of be pushed out. The French and the British, they vie for power and the French or the, the French are in more of the Ohio River Valley area. So if we have the United States, here's Florida, here's Texas. Huh. Man, my drawing skills, they're great, huh? And we have Michigan, and I don't, yeah, I think that's Wisconsin. Okay, so there we go. And we have Ohio, about right here. Here's the Appalachian Mountains. The French are all up in this area and also in the Ohio River Valley. And the colonies are all over here. So this would be all the British over here in this area. And that area starts to kind of fill up. And the colonists want to go over the Appalachian Mountains into the Ohio River Valley. But the French are like, nah, we really don't want you here. And the natives are like, nah, we really don't want you here either. And so the French and the Indians team up to fight the British. So it's called the French and Indian War, but it's actually the French and Indians against the British. The British end up winning and they kick the French out. But the Native Americans are not happy about this. And they're like, mm, no, we still don't want you in here. We know we lost the war, but you still can't come over. And so the colonists, as they're going across and trying to settle in the Ohio River Valley, the Native Americans are fighting with them and massacring them. And that's when the colonists say, hey, king, can you help us out? And the king's like, no, nope, not really, because I just fought a war for you people and I don't have any money left. I don't have any money that I want to spend to protect you. And so that's when he passes the proclamation and he says, nope, you can't go into the Ohio River Valley. That is going to lead the colonists to be upset with the king. It's one of the reasons they're eventually going to want the American Revolution because they're like, hey, we just fought for this land. We want to go in it and enjoy it. And the king's like, no, you can't. And so that was one of the causes of the American Revolution, which we will talk about in January. So that is going on right now. There's just a ton of stuff during this period. And um, economic systems. Oh, this is important. So we have the joint stock company. Remember, joint stock company is where um, everybody goes in together and they invest. So if it is crappy and it doesn't work, not everybody will lose. Uh, I'm sorry, not just one person will lose their money. Everybody will lose their money. Everyone will share in the losses and everyone shares in the successes. That's joint stock company. We have triangular trade. Triangular trade is the trade coming from the old world. Oh, this is going to be good. Look at this. All right. So um, <laughs> that's Spain. Oh, I forgot the boot. Here we go. There's Italy. And then we have Africa down here. And we have the new world over here and ah, it's actually not too bad. Okay, so there's South America. So 
We have manufactured goods coming from Europe. They stop in Africa and pick up slaves. They come over to the New World, drop off slaves, manufactured goods, and they pick up raw materials and go back to the Old World. This is called triangular trade. So just remember that raw materials come from the New World. Manufactured goods come from the Old World. And whew, we're almost done, guys. Why is this not focusing? It's annoying. We're almost done. We're on the last page. Okay, so hang with me. Here we go. So we also have some synchronism in belief systems. Remember, we have these African religions coming over and mixing with Christianity. Also, we have Aztec, Inca religions and um, South American religions as well forming with Christianity and starting something new. An example would be voodoo. That's an example of African African oh my God <laughs> African religion synchronizing with Christianity. I'm so glad you guys are uh, patient with me because I cannot talk tonight. Couldn't talk last night either. I think it's just the result of this long week. Okay, so lastly, we have challenges to state power. And basically what that means is that people weren't always happy with the fact that these big empires were ruling them. So one challenge we have is King Philip's War. And this is where the natives actually attack the English colonists. Eventually it's shut down, but they at least try. We also have a ruler in Africa. And I'm going to put the name up here. I think it's Zinga. I think the N is silent. Uh, but she is a ruler in South Central Africa. And basically, she starts to ally with the Portuguese for protection. Uh, but that, allowance, or that alliance breaks down. And um, her and her people flee to the West. And that's where she builds a city. And it becomes a refuge for runaway slaves. This is her city, Matamba. So at first she is kind of on the side of the Europeans. Then when they no longer have an alliance, she makes a refuge for runaway slaves seeking their freedom. And last but not least, in Russia, serfdom is basically keeping the peasants under control. And it's very regulated by the nobility because it provides free labor for the nobility. So of course they want it. The peasants of course are eventually going to rebel. There was one specific rebellion that was led by the Cossacks and Catherine the Great shuts this down. And she basically does this with the Russian army. So that keeps the serfs under control for quite a while longer because they're scared of the empire striking back at them. So that's what we have for unit three and four. Does anybody have any quick questions before I hop off of here and go relax a little bit this evening before it starts over tomorrow? Any quick questions? Go ahead and put them on there. If you haven't subscribed yet, make sure and do that as well and turn on your notifications. I know several kiddos told me they missed the live last night and that's probably because notifications weren't turned on. So don't forget to do that. And last but not least, we have Saturday tutorials from 9 to 12. So if you still need some help with anything, you can come by on Saturday tutorials and I will be there to help you. I'll also be at school tomorrow after school in the library until 415. So if you need any help uh, tomorrow, last minute advice or whatever on your timeline, I will be there. All right. Well, it doesn't look like we have any more questions tonight. So thank you so much for joining and listening. And I wish you amazing luck on your final. I know you're, you'll, <laughs> I know you will do amazing. Just make sure you study, make some flashcards, come by Saturday tutorials and I'll help you. I love making flashcards. All right. See you later. Have a good night. I definitely am going to rest. Let me tell you, I am tired today. All right. Good night.